Thank you guys all so much for joining us this, this morning and afternoon. Um, we all are here to talk about a very special movie, A Mouthful of Air. Um, I think this is a topic that we all agree is incredibly important and unfortunately not talked about enough. Um, and thanks to Amy Copeland's beautiful film, it gives us an opportunity to have a platform to just have a really open and honest conversation amongst ourselves about this. Um, today, we have Oscar nominated actress, Amanda Seyfried. We have director, producer, writer, author of the book by the same name, um, Amy Copelman. And with us on the phone and hopefully soon on video is one of America's most trusted pediatricians. Um, he is the founder of Happiest Baby and also the inventor of the Snoo Smart Sleeper, um, Dr. Harvey Karp. Um, thank you all again for taking the time and thank you guys for being here with us. Um, I'm just gonna dive right in because I know everybody who's participating has seen the movie and has questions for you. So let's just get the conversation started. Um, our first conversation is gonna come from As the Bunny Hops with Amy Fulcher. Amy, please unmute yourself. Hey guys, I, one of the things that really moved me when I was watching the film was how you approached such a deep and important subject with such beauty and color and a fun aesthetic background to it. So Amy, I would love to know kind of your thought process about making it so colorful and so bright and happy looking while taking on such a deep and dark topic. Well, I think that we've, we've always seen depression portrayed as a very like emo, heavy black line, eyeliner, dark thing. And I think we're talking about postpartum depression and motherhood and putting on the mask of a smile. And um, I was trying to show the dichotomy between those two things. But the thing that was most important to me was to have a character that you saw, saw all the beauty in the world, loved her family, loved her children, and you know, loved you know, every little yellow flower that pops up through the ice and still you know, thought the world would be better off without her. And so I wanted to show that she had both those things within her. Yeah, I loved how her character always would stop and like look at the balloons and point those things out, which I think as parents and moms are always so busy and we're on the move. And I love to see how, you know, her character would stop and really try to smell the roses, even though inside she was really, really struggling. So I thought that was such an incredible way you showed so many sides. And Amanda, you could see it through your eyes. You could see the pain that you were going through and you were trying to mask so so beautifully, even though you knew inside, you must have just been falling apart. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's such a, I think part, you know, part of the struggle um, in very specifically in, in Julie's story is that, you know, she, it doesn't, it almost doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to her even as well as much to Ethan. Um, and it's just so hard to watch something like that and to, to know that someone understand, just like you said, sees the beauty in the world. Like she's, the thing I love about Julie so much and something that I can really relate to on some level is that she is growing up with her kids as well. She allows moments and presence to, uh, she embraces those things um, because it's, 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 you know, seeing the world through your ch children's eyes. It's like, it's what we all, want to do but have all these responsibilities and especially responsibility of taking care of your kids so it's I just I love you're the same you are that you, you you're childlike and so in the best ways and it, it really it's the reason I think part, partly the reason her her children are incredible and why I think my children hopefully will be as amazing as your children um and I think that's it, it, and 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 it's I think that's confusing to Julie and and it, I'm, I imagine to a lot of people who are feeling so bad yet want desperately to feel good. Right. She doesn't, yeah. she isn't, there's, there's nothing romantic about her depression to yeah. her. You know, there's, she, if she would do anything she possibly could to escape it. And I think that we thought a lot about color when we were, when we were filming because it's almost the, the more down she is like toward the end of the movie, the more saturated the color is it's the more almost like she's holding on to it as, as much as she can, as if the insistence on color, the insistence on like the vibrancy of it will somehow, you know, keep her here. Um, and we tried to, we tried to show that. Well, thank you so much. 
Our next question is going to come from Ashley Saunders from Ashley and Company. Hi, ladies. Um, so you kind of touched on this a little bit, Amanda, but what made you want to sign on to star in this film? Being a mother yourself, was there anything else you found relatable about Julie or extra difficult to betray? I mean, it's very heavy subject matter to be in with, but was yeah. anything more of a struggle than others? I think, um, well, I wanted to be, I met Amy, who I read her letter to me months after she had sent it, because I guess it, <laughs> things get busy. Um, and I think I, I just found, there aren't many stories about this that are, I mean, there are like no stories told in this very specific way, which is from such a compassionate place, a very feeling place. I think, um, I just wanted to embody this character because I understood as a parent it, at the baseline level, I understood as a parent, you know, how scary it is to be a mom. And then to go deeper into this specific woman's mental, um, emotional and mental struggles. Uh, it was just, I felt in some ways, it felt like it needed, it needed to be done. And when I met Amy, it needed to be, we needed to tell the story together. That's what it was just, it was very obvious to me that it, this movie needed to be made um, it, through her, through this vessel, through her heart and uh, her vision. And then um, I think it was, you know, I'll tell you that like the, there was some logistical struggles. And <laughs> like, it, it was really hard to get this movie made just in general, people are, you know, people, it's hard to get people to wanna, to wanna invest in something like this. Um, which is why it's so amazing that it got made and why I think it really is going to help, help you know, generate some change. And, uh, you know, the, I think the struggle was just not, not taking it home. Like, at, like any acting job, you don't, you know, the, the stuff that's really, really hard, you don't want to take it home. But I feel like I was really able to be, this taught me to be more present with my, with my daughter, who I had just one daughter at the time. To be even more present because I felt so lucky that I wasn't struggling um, the same way Julie was, and and I also knew how many people are struggling and how people how many people will struggle, and so it's like a it's something that needs a lot of attention, and and it's hard to know that people are dealing with this, but it's also I mean it felt really good that we were we were opening this this box up through through her her eyes. Thank you, Amanda. I have to just say that Amanda thought of making her a children's book author. I don't remember that. <laughs> she doesn't remember that. I kind of remember that. I remember that. <laughs> and um, huh. I think that, you know, I think that changes everything and um, really helps us understand the way in which she sees the world, the, her hope for the world. And that would it exist without Amanda. She doesn't really ever take enough credit. And then the other thing I want to say is we had a lot of fun because we would get to cuddle together. The great thing about making a, um, a low budget movie yeah. is it's not like everybody has their own trailers. So we got to have a lot of No matter time. what, in shooting, there was always a room yeah. where we would have producers meetings. It would just be like a bed. And we'd be like, okay, how do you think things are going? We would like have powwows because, yeah. you know, it was stressful. Yeah. But also this movie turned out the way it did because we were so connected at, at every turn. Yeah. even when it got hard. So just saying like it goes a long way when you really, especially when the lead actor and, and the, the director and writer can be on the same page and be very open and vulnerable. Yeah, like I remember the day that she was doing the scene on the bed, I knew I wasn't gonna be able to direct her and I sent her a text oh. and then we just, like a, a, a voice, no. A, a video. A video, thank you. And um, through, text. through text, I'm very bad with technology. And um, then we never had to speak that day. She, she did the bed and I was next to her like under the bed or by the side of the bed. Um, but you know, you never think that you're gonna, so I'm much older than Amanda. Like I'm actually old enough to be Amanda's mom, but you so, never think um, you're gonna get yes. that moment when, you know, to make a new friend and to get to fall in love with somebody Mm -hmm. And her inner beauty is even more beautiful than her outer beauty. And so it was just very lucky that I was such a genius and knew to cast her. <laughs> but uh, 
it, it's really her heart that's in there merged with my heart. So that's what you're looking at for better or worse. Well, thank you again, you guys, for making this amazing movie. Um, we, we have some more questions to be had. Um, our just next saying, just oh, to sorry. add one, one comment about that, which I just want to broaden it a tiny bit. I mean, I think that the colors in, for me, the colors that were so, and the, and the pinky tinkerbink, I mean, even the name invites you in. And that's the whole point that big budget movies are made on war and, you know, catastrophe and all this man stuff, which is great and exciting and interesting, but the struggle uh, is, is real and it's universal. I mean, this is about a woman with severe depression and, and, you all know the story, but this is an everyday issue. I mean, the, the most pervasive problem that new mothers face in our culture is exhaustion and feeling overwhelmed because every mother should be patting herself on the back because they're doing something that they were never meant to do. They're raising a child or a family without the help of five nannies, right? Because you're supposed to have your mother, your aunt, your grandmother, your older sister, the next door neighbor's older daughter. No one's supposed to do this on their own, much less as a single parent. So um, right now, when the movie started being made, the incidence of, of clinical depression and women, I mean, so many women are, are exhausted, but they get, they drift into, you know, negative thoughts and obsessive thoughts the way Julie did. Um, that's about 20% of all new mothers. And during COVID, one study out of a Brigham Women's Hospital in Boston raised that up to about 36%. And so for me, this is such an important movie because it gets the conversation going. Thank God not everyone is going to be as extremely affected as Julie. But for each Julie, there's a thousand women who are struggling and men as well. It's not just women, by the way. You saw how, how Julie's husband was struggling and and oftentimes they'll even go into depression as well because of sleep deprivation. I'll, I'll tell you just one last thing and then I'll shut up, which is that we train Navy <laughs> SEALs to endure torture by putting them through sleep deprivation with the sound of crying babies over loudspeakers. And if you remember the most, one of the most challenging scenes in the movie is when Julie's making the formula and the baby is crying that cry goes deep into your heart. It makes you feel so incompetent and so incapable as a parent. And, and so this is something that's very real and is really um, experienced by probably close to a million women in the United States this year will go through something, maybe not as extreme, but some shade of that blue. Yeah, I remember when my son was born, I. I, I was so scared because of the depression to take my eyes off him. I was so positive that if I took my eyes off him for one second, something would happen. And I you know, would take, if he was asleep in the crib or anything, and there was anything hanging above him, I would take it off every night and put it on the ground. And then I would just watch him. And I remember thinking, if I could get toothpicks and just put them in my eyes, then my eyes wouldn't be able to shut because I was petrified of falling asleep because if I fell asleep, oh, so you know, anything, yeah. anything could happen if I looked away for, you know, one second. And um, that is true. That that's a fascinating thing. What you said about torture and Navy SEALs that I never thought of that sleep, de so sleep deprivation. And, you, um, you know, um, just to say that, that what you described, I mean, what you're describing in terms of the anxiety, which I think was so beautifully portrayed in the movie, not boohoo crying all the time. I mean, Julie was not in tears nonstop. The tears came very seldomly, but the stress, the anxiety, the feeling of I'm not good enough, they're better off without me. Um, the voice in your head, that's the thing that so many people struggle with. And I would say postpartum anxiety those fears and concerns, the postpartum anxiety, the fears and concerns are even more pervasive than actually what people think is gonna happen, which is they're sad all the time and they're blue and they're crying. For most women, that's actually not what it is. It's an anxious depression. Yeah. No, thank you. And I, I, I'm sorry, I agree with that scene when she's trying to make the formula. I, rem I remember 
feeling those moments of just sheer anxiety when you feel like you can't keep it under control. And I felt like that was such a relatable scene, whether or not you have experienced something like postpartum, just being a new mother, it's overwhelming. Um, but I know we have a ton of more questions, so I'd love to dive back in and get to some of them. Um, our next question is going to come from Kathy Cupkit from Bel Air Mommy. Hi, Amanda. Hi, everyone. Amanda, it's nice to see you again. I interviewed you, um, I believe it was like two weeks ago. But thank you so much for the movie. And Dr. Karp, actually, I had a question for you. I wanted to know, um, not that I want an instant fix, but how would you let moms know what to look for and what signs to look for that they are, they might be depressed or they are going through depression? And what word of advice would you give when they have negative thoughts creeping up on them? Yeah, great question. I mean, uh, we... Right now, the, the standard in medicine is that every woman's supposed to be screened for postpartum depression during pregnancy, and then a couple of times after the baby is born. So that's a way that we get some insights into it. But I was talking to a friend who's, who was delivered recently in New York, and, and the nurse went up, sat them down and said to the mother, your job is to take care of the baby. And then she looked straight in the, in the husband's eyes and said, your job? is everything else. <laughs> and, and setting the expectations appropriately, I think is something that we can really help people with. This is not the time to write thank you notes. This is not the time to worry about bringing people into your house and entertaining. This is not the time to be what my mother would call stupid polite. This is the time to really circle your wagons and take care of, the, of, of your responsibility, which is this very vulnerable little baby. And to recognize the fact that you are doing something that in the past women had three, four, five helpers doing. So rather than feeling insufficient, you should feel amazing that you can juggle all these balls. My job as a pediatrician is to really do two things. One is to give parents skills. And that's something that, that I wrote about in, in, a, uh, in, in a book, in a video called The Happiest Baby on the Block. It's something called the five S's, which are commonly taught and now in hospitals and clinics and really all around the world. But the other thing and Wait, what, what, what are they? What are the five S's? The five S's are five ways of imitating the womb. The key concept really is that newborns aren't really ready for the world. They need a fourth trimester of being held and rocked. And so the concept is that you imitate the womb with five steps. So swaddling, side or stomach position, not for sleep, for sleep, it's only the back, but for calming a crying baby. Like when Julie had the baby in her arms, that baby was on her back. Had she been rolled towards the stomach, the baby might've calmed down in a couple of seconds. Um, the third is shushing, the fourth is swinging a rhythmic motion and the fifth is sucking. So right there, we can make an enormous difference because crying and exhaustion lead to bad feelings. But if you can calm the crying and you can help the baby sleep, it leads to good feeling. It makes you feel competent and sufficient and like the best mother who ever lived. We're on that balance point when we have a new baby and you can go either direction, feeling worse about yourself or feeling better. And sometimes it's very little things that help push it in the right direction. The last thing I would just say is that we're doing a study now with SNU, which is our new robotic baby bed, which adds an hour or two to the baby's sleep um, and increases the longest episode of sleep because it isn't just sleep, it's getting undisturbed sleep that becomes so important for all of us because sleep deprivation leads to depression in anyone and especially new parents. So we have a study that just got completed actually in Australia looking at 150 women at high risk for depression and I'm not saying this is the cure-all for it. There are many reasons that women fall into depression. But we're hoping, if we're lucky, we may be able to prevent 30 to 50% wow, impact just through giving sleep, reducing crying. And it, it, I, I'm not saying that those are the numbers yet. We don't have the numbers yet. So I want to be a little cautious about that. But that's my expectation. Um, increasing sleep, reducing crying reducing the fear that babies are going to roll to an unsafe position. Snoo keeps babies on the back all night long. And giving mothers and fathers a 24-hour caregiver for the cost of a Starbucks coffee. I'm not here to, to promote this, I'm, but I am here to say that there are tools that we're working on to try to, to try to give new hope to women who are really outnumbered by this one little baby. That's what it feels like. Yeah. It does. It does. I had the happiest baby on the block in my in my nightstand, 
and my kid, my youngest is seven. Like, I'm not even kidding. Um, okay, our next question is going to come from um, Janice Seitzer from Whiskey and Sunshine. Hi. Janice, so, oh, there we go. Yeah, oh, no, I'm here. So you've kind of touched on what I was going to ask already, but I really just wanted to know sort of in general, you know, what you were hoping for the audience to take away from this movie, but tied to that, like, why is it, do you think that postpartum depression in particular, and then just mental illness in general are so stigmatized in our country and not addressed? You, Amy and Amanda, you wanna take that one first? First one about the movie. What do you want people oh. to take away? And then I'll ask you the next one. Oh gosh. I, I, I don't know the answer. But I was going to say, I've been thinking a, a lot about that idea of why motherhood, why this is a topic that people don't like to talk about, why it's a, like a third rail somehow. And I don't know like the eloquent way to say it exactly, but I do think so much of how we are socialized to define ourselves as women is, is predicated on how, on our maternal nature, you know, we teach our kids from the, when they're little, the little girls, they play with, with dolls. I'm, I'm being um, gender specific here. Uh, I just said that wrong, but I don't. I don't mean to offend anybody by saying girl or boy, but in the traditional way, uh, you know, we teach little girls like play with your kitchens and play with your babies, and so much of how we grow up to define ourselves is based on this idea of what our maternal instinct is, and then we have a baby and and we misinterpret our fear or um, doubts as, as somehow making us not maternal, not capable. I forgot until somebody mentioned it to me yesterday, my big fear was telling anybody that I was scared because I thought they would take Sam away from me. And I, I totally forgot this until yesterday, but I was petrified of this because my shame of what it meant to say, I don't know how to cut his fingernails, which is like, how would I possibly know how to cut his fingernails? But I was so, um, you know, I, I was so scared that I thought that I was going to be, you know, deemed such a bad mother because I couldn't cut his fingernails that, you know, they'd have to take him away. Now, of course, I was, wasn't a hundred percent thinking clearly. And so that was an exaggerated reaction, but I do think it has to do something with how women define themselves and what we think it is to be maternal. Right. And in the mental illness, uh, more generally, it's like, I think as someone who does struggle with um, one, a pretty very specific form of it, I, it's just scary to talk about because mental illness is scary. It, it, it's, uh, it's still stigmatized because people are still not talking about it. And it's still not like at the federal level, it's not, it's still not recognized as something that is this, that common. And their access to any kind of healthcare is still not very affordable. And it, it's still like a, a niche kind of, has a niche place in the world, which is so bizarre because, you know, the more recognizable people, you know, um, that talk about it, the more you think um, more, you know, the, the safer people hopefully feel and the less alone people feel, you know, people who are struggling with mental illness. But for some reason, it's just really slow and, um, especially when it comes to maternal health care. Mm -hmm. Obviously, this is why we wanted to make the movie, yeah. but it's, um, I don't know, it's stigmatized because people are still really afraid to be labeled because there's still a label and people mm -hmm. are afraid to seem weak. They don't want to lose their jobs. I will tell you that I was told at one point in my career to stop talking about the medicine that I take and my OCD because um, of the stigma. And I, I luckily am like, filterless and want to talk about it because I know it helps people. Mm -hmm. um, it's still something that I'm, people are like, you got to be careful how you talk. And it's just like, it is my own experience. So I do feel free to talk about my own experience. Um, but it, it's, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how to change it. I think yeah. it's just more people need to understand that mental illness is a thing that, that a lot of people struggle with. That it's, mm -hmm. that it's no different than asthma. Like if, if you took that, your yeah. child to the park and put them in a swing, you know, and we're having a hard time breathing, you would whip out your inhaler and take it and you would never think twice about it. You would never say, oh, I'm a bad mother because I needed an inhaler at the park. You would just take it and then 
you would enjoy swinging your child when you're depressed mm -hmm. and you're at the park and you're sure that is the baby going to fall out of the swing are the metal things going to you know fall down from you know the rod i mean i my children still tell me how badly i failed park i was scared of everything in park you know is the man 200 feet away coming to yeah. snatch my child this those are symptoms of of more you know acute depression or anxiety and the problem is so many of the symptoms are reinforce the illness so the symptoms of telling you you know you're not good enough you can't handle it then the end part of that sentence is so you better not tell anybody yeah. because then they're going to know you're not good enough and not and can't handle it or it's hopeless so i shouldn't go ask for help like every way when you're not thinking when you're thinking off like that every way in that maze you find yeah. a way that you're going to hit it makes a wall it, it makes it more real too like when you talk about it, it makes it more real and the truth is as scary as that is, that's actually kind of a, a, a really good way to open yourself up to, to healing, which is yeah. that, you know, it's that it's, I mean, God, it's, it's. You know, there's another big factor, which is people don't want to know about it because that means that they have a responsibility to act. Yes. So and true. one of the things we're trying to do is get federal and state legislation in place so that we have more centers and more supports, not just for women with depression, for women with babies. I mean, what, one of the things that COVID exposed was that, you know, working women are working squared women, right? I mean, they're working double jobs and working men as well who have young children at home. So um, although it's clear, and we all know this to be true, is that when it comes to the jobs in the house, you know, <laughs> what was the meme I saw the other day, you know, um, why is it that, you know, I'm doing this, 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 and this, this with my kid, and my husband watches two hours of Dune holding my baby, and everyone thinks he's like, you know, the <laughs> best supportive uh, partner. But um, one of the things I would always teach um, my families is the, the only normal family is the one you don't know very well because you just start asking questions and everyone's got a story to tell and i think that one of the goals of this movie and the, the discussion around it pardon sorry for the noise but the goal is to have conversations and again not that this is marginalized and this is julie is a more extreme case of it but to really talk about how parenting should be people in other cultures think we're idiots yeah. that we would have a baby and instead of the woman being surrounded by five women washing her feet and making her her favorite foods we're basically saying suck it up and deal with it and don't complain about the crying by the way and the sad thing is and this is the thing we have to change first is that women accept that they buy the lie they believe yeah i'm supposed to do it all it's what a mother does no it's not what a mother does a mother's never done this in the history of humanity without support without training without that type of backup and so it's really recognizing which so many other countries recognize is that social services are not a handout they are a strengthening of the of the fabric of our society and one yeah. thing i think that i wanted to touch on too and then um, we have a dad on the, on this call too and i'd love to go to tobin next is i love ethan's perspective in this movie i loved seeing how ethan was looking at her and processing and he wanted to trust her even though deep down he felt like he maybe shouldn't couldn't wouldn't and i thought that was such an interesting perspective that i think is very also neglected and not talked about is what is the father feeling thinking going through along with the mother in these early childhood stages so tobin um from the good bad dad we'd love to hear from you good bad dad that's a good name <laughs> yeah thank you and and there. thanks for Thanks for the kind introduction. I was the last one to arrive, so I appreciate getting bumped up in the line here. So um, I guess my question is, is, is exactly in line with what you're talking about, Ari. I wanted, so the dads that read my review of the movie and, and my thoughts about the movie, what, what would be sort of an elementary school level of, hey, if you see signs in your wife postpartum, what, you, what should you do at minimum? What should you do to be to the extreme and the most supportive husband you could absolutely be. Can you kind of walk that spectrum, the three of you guys with me, and what you think the movie does to paint those different broad strokes? Harvey, you, you want to answer that? Sure, sure, I'd be happy to. So, um, I mean, the first thing is, you know, it wasn't that Julie was a liar. It was that we all have 
shame about about when we're failing at what we think is our the job that we can we should be able to do and everyone else is able to do and so partly uh, partners have to recognize that this isn't something that's going to be easy for their partner to talk about and their partner may not even realize it yet you know so it's it's checking in with them it's a lot of physical contact a lot of letting them know that they are great moms and that they're doing what they can with so little help um you know uh, there's a lot of anxiety about about um about um about your body condition after you have the baby and how you look and the experience of having a baby and what that was for a husband to see you in that situation it's very important to let your wife or your partner know how beautiful they are and what an incredible mother and what a great job and what happens when you do that is you open the door for them to feel like this is a safe environment to maybe share some of what's going on. Um, you can even probe a little bit and say, you know, do you ever do you ever worry that you're not going to be a good enough mom? You know, or what's your memory of your mom and how was that and how do you want it to be different? You know, you can ask a couple of probing questions that give an open door to discussing their experiences. And don't think that just asking one time is going to be the answer because. Again, the shame is really is really significant for a lot of people, um, and so you have to really demonstrate you truly want to hear. It's not just you're you're being perfunctory in your in your questioning. I, it's you know when she goes to see that house and she says, "Do you think we'll be happy here?" and he says, "I really do." She, I feel like she, the shame for her it comes in a wave. So sometimes you might ask, and it might be a moment where Julie felt okay, like depression exists on a continuum. So I do think you have to keep asking or like, hey, you want me to stand with you when you give a baby a bath? Because that to me was always the scariest, the bath time. You know, was I gonna accidentally, uh, you know, drown the baby? Was, was, was it gonna be because, you know, I couldn't control some impulse and like accidentally drown the baby? And like the last thing I ever wanted to do was, you know, drown my child. But, you know, you get so scared because your inability to trust yourself that if, you know, if my husband was next to me, um, the times that he was, I was much less scared because there was somebody you could say, oh, can you hold the towel? You know, you could, you know, will you hold the head? And so it just makes you feel less scared. For me, uh, with Ethan, we talked a lot about this, Amanda, Finn and I, for him, he's kind of a prisoner the entire time that she's pregnant. He, and I, I think that so many people who love people who have depression, um, do feel like prisoners. You don't want to be the last person to say the thing that you think is going to incite them to then, you know, call it a, you know, a day. Um, you don't know what to say. And, and so I think you are constantly trying to gauge the temperature. And I saw that in the bookstore when we saw it on the big screen, because we got to see it on the big screen yeah. first time. And I could see it in his eyes. He's like looking at her in the bookshop, trying to see, is she okay? Like she's saying she's okay. And it's very hard for anybody who loves somebody who's depressed to figure out how to get in. Yeah, because he's on his own island. That's the thing. And I know, I know how, you know, I, how hard it was even just from, from my husband just to, to feel like he could help in every way he could, but not be able to reach, reach me in my, I'm, I'm, I wasn't suffering like Julie, but to that depth, but like, yeah. it was, it, it was just, it's, 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 you're an island and, 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 and Julie's an island and, and they just can't reach each other because that's what that's what depression and anxiety do. Yeah, and I think men in general, like I know my husband always says, after the first year, I'm fantastic. After the first year, you, yeah. you know, I never need, but until the first year, he always says, you know, you're looking, it's like they're in a club. I mean, he felt, you know, I'm putting words into his mouth, but basically the two of us existed as one, like literally as one. And then we were so intimate, you know, with each kid and they are on the outside. They're actually literally like the old definition of literally, like literally on the outside. And then the baby's born and you're, you know, have a different understanding and way of handling the baby, at least, you know, ostensibly you do, or they think you do. The thing that men need to understand is that we might feel as lost or, you know, confused by this new situation, you know, as, as they do, unfamiliar and awkward. And I think, again, I think all I women- Just under- Oh, sorry, yeah. 
So no, I just want to underscore that point. And, and again, from just from the practical point of view, um, you're not going to you oftentimes you're not going to see someone crying in the corner as the sign that they're depressed. It's anxiety. And this thing about the baby, it's all my responsibility. The more anxiety you see around that and stay away and we have to keep people away. I mean, of course, there's a reality to that. But when you get a sense that anxiety is bubbling up a little bit too much or that you're being excluded from this relationship. I mean, we really hope women will invite men in and help them feel confident. And, oh, honey, you know, you're so good at wrapping the baby. <laughs> you know, um, you know give, give, some, give some compliments so that men don't feel like we're the fifth wheel. Um, um, but I think that looking for signs of anxiety that you feel are excessive is a is an important first step to look for when men are trying to judge the risk. Thank you. That's super. I, I'm sorry, I was gonna say for me, um, I would never have cried because that would have been too much of a clue. And I was so scared, like I said, that I was such a bad person that you know Sam would be taken away from me. So I would never have cried. And I remember I didn't start taking antidepressant medication until he was like one and a half. And I remember driving him in a car and hearing a song and crying and being able to cry and feel the song and cry and not feel like I was never going to be able to stop. That was this other fear I had that if I started crying and explained how I felt, not only would Sam get taken away from me, he'd get taken away from me because I'd start crying and I'd cry so hard and I would never be able to stop that, of course, they'd have to take him away. And it doesn't sound logical because you know, you're not well, you're not breathing, you have asthma, it's just, it's in your thought process. And um, so I, I think you have to really, it's very difficult for anybody who loves anybody who's depressed, because depressive people are very good actors. Okay, guys, we have time for three more questions. Um, our next question is going to come from another doctor we have on the phone, um, Dr. Kim Van Dusen from The Parentologist. Hi everyone. Um, gosh, just such a phenomenal movie. So thank you. I'm so glad that they were able to make it. Um, I'm a mom of two and also, um, as, as Ari mentioned, a licensed um, medical, uh, medical, a licensed um, therapist. Um, and so the movie hit me on both sides as a mom and as a clinician. Um, and Dr. Karp, I always teach your five S's in my parent-child therapy class that I teach. So thank you for those. Um, so we were talking about the stigma earlier. Um, when the line thanks so much oh of course um when if you were a diabetic would you stop taking your medicine and the response was julie says it isn't the same thing and i think that really uh encapsulates the the idea of the stigma that people can easily talk about their medical con concerns and everything we talked about earlier i don't want to focus on that but i just love that line it was just such a well-written line that i literally wrote it down because um it really like i said encapsulates that stigma um I was in tears when it ended. Um, it was, like I said, very, very powerful. Um, and when Julie was laying in the bed in the hospital after her daughter was born and was refusing to take her medicine, I was like screaming at my computer, please just take the medicine, take the medicine. So my question for you is, um, when you were writing the movie, um, did you ever consider an alternate ending where she takes her medicine and is able to manage her depression more? <clears throat> As you were talking just now, you made me remember the answer that somebody else had asked, you know, what did I want people to take from the movie? And for me, Julie's a cautionary tale. The happy ending comes, you know, I have a 25 year old son. I must have been writing through the fears. I didn't know this at the time because I wrote the novel like 20 years ago of, you know, what exactly what you're talking about. You know, what if I hadn't gotten the help I needed? What if I didn't take the medication? But I am the happy ending. And I want anyone who sees it to be their own happy ending. Um, I want them through Julie, who's a fictional character, to be able to empathize with her and hold her in her head as this kind of, you know, manifestation of, of what a depressed mom can look like um, and to not feel shame and to find, you know, you look at Julie and you realize what a good person she was and how desperately she wanted to be there for her kids. And our hope is that, you know, in some tiny, tiny little way, however we can, you know, if we save one life, Amanda and I will feel so good, right? Like that we, that we saved, that we helped somebody get that happy ending. 
I never thought about making this a movie until a couple of years ago, I was driving down the West Side Highway and a girl called into doctor's radio, a mother crying over some ironing board, I tell you this, and she, the, the doctor said, well, you know, you have an illness, you know, go to the doctor. No, I can't go to the, your husband. I can't go to the priest. I can't. And I remember thinking, oh, I thought everybody knew about this now because, you know, famous people talked about it and it was on People magazine, but people don't know or people don't think the same rules apply to them. They don't allow for themselves to 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 accept themselves in that way. Um, and so we're hoping that somehow we can, you know, reach that woman in the Midwest and we can tell her, please, you know, ask for help. Did you ever consider the ending being different? Oh, sorry, that specific question? Uh, no. Yeah. I have to say though, I would have made so much more money. Like I would have, I remember Double Day had offered me um, a book deal. This is like 2001 or something. And Double Day was a bookstore, but it was also an imprint. And they would have paid me $10,000. And all I had, and that was like a very big book deal. And I would have made, they would have printed like 30,000 books. This is like all you wanted for a writer if you were me at the time. But all I had to do was have her call, because there's infanticide in the novel, call 911. And I was like, the problem is, if you're having a psychotic break, you can't call 911 by virtue of the fact that you're having a psychotic break. And at that moment, I pretty much set the trajectory of my writing career on a certain path. Uh, but I didn't want to change the ending, because I did believe, and I believe this with all everything that I write, the um, characters that have moved me the most um, you know, are, are the characters that I wanted to be, that I learned from and saw myself in, but wanted to be different then, wanted to have a different outcome then. And also it just wasn't true to me for Julie. I, I think the voice in Julie's head is louder than, um, you know, her ability to overcome it. Yeah. I mean, what do you think, uh, Hardy, that there's going to be a way to do a quantifiable test you know, that's simple. Like, you know, I think one of the big problems is with asthma, you can measure the breath, right? So you don't feel crazy because you can measure, you know, how little you're breathing. With diabetes, you can measure, you know, your sugar levels. But with this, I mean, I, I think I told you this on my way to the premiere two weeks ago, I turned to my husband in the car. Oh yeah, I said this. And I said, did I have postpartum depression? <laughs> like even my mind now wants to tell myself that I was making it up, right? Uh, not, of course, I mean, of course I did. I don't think you could actually write that movie if you didn't really. But, you know, it's just depression's a tricky thing on your head. Right. When do you think they're going to be able to give us proof in a test? Well, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a um, sliding scale, right? It's a spectrum. So there's, there's little, medium, a lot, and psychotic. So, I mean, um, we, we, we screen women with tests, we have like five question screeners and 10 question screeners. And we're pretty good actually at detecting them, but we're, it's not enough. I mean, what the studies show, so a big study out of Kaiser, 100,000 women were detected with elevated screens uh, shortly after the baby was born. Six months later, half of them still had elevated screens for depression, even though they were under treatment. And in most cases, Studies have shown that we, you know, of the women who screen positive, five or only five or ten percent of them ever get treatment. Ninety percent of them end up falling through the cracks. There's, we will never to handle a million women with postpartum. Ever, we, you know, I was telling someone the other day, if a million women every year were getting tuberculosis, we wouldn't screen for TB and treat them. We would figure out why the heck are they getting TB? How do we prevent it? And so there are many things that we can't prevent with, with postpartum depression, like you know, being raped and a painful delivery and all that kind of stuff that can push you in that direction. But baby care is something that we can, and we're, we're, we're making a big difference right now. And in many studies, it is, the, it is the straw that breaks the camel's back, that screaming, that exhaustion, that feeling like there's no one there to help you. That's something we can do. And actually, I'm extremely, extremely excited we have over 60 major corporations that give SNU away as a, as a benefit. And I believe within the wow. next two or three years, we'll get insurance companies and governmental agencies providing this, just like we do a breast pump. And that's not gonna take care of the whole problem, but, but I think it's gonna be a big step forward.
what about what about you know aftercare? I mean, the the the, the thing. I, my point was always, I get to go to the doctor every week after thirty six weeks, and or I've been to the doctor a bajillion times up until I deliver, and then that's it. You get one after postpartum two week visit with your now gynecologist and and then the hospital bills, but you get like, there's nothing. I mean, I, I heard in Virginia that they are now giving men, nurses are coming to people's homes after birth. I, I, I think, I forget what county that is, or I don't, I, I need to look that up, but it was something I had heard from somebody had mentioned to me a while back. And I thought, you know, why don't we have that? Like lactation consultants, they're in the hospital to talk to you the day of delivery or the day after delivery, but, there's an extra fee. Uh, there was a, certainly for, for, in my experience, and they don't, you don't get to take them home. You know, it's like, there are lactation consultants, there are therapists that you, that you can reach out to, but that's only if you have time and money. So for the most part, where's our fourth trimester care? Why, why aren't we being visited the first couple of weeks at home for free or under insurance or whatever? And, and what, why, why, why are we just being completely forgotten? as soon as we give birth? Well, it, it's, it's, a big, it's a big job. And I would say that for the last 15 years, we've had many programs of home visiting nurse programs, especially in high risk populations. Um, I, we're, there's a big bill right now before Congress on, for paid maternal leave or paid parental leave rather, okay. which I think is something that's very important. Um, getting services to help improve sleep, getting more childcare services out there and investing in um, supporting these men and women who, who work in childcare settings, because right now they could earn more money flipping burgers. I mean, all of that is a societal investment. And I think I was just in Washington two weeks ago and I met with the leader of the Republican uh, caucus in the house and one of the leaders in the progressive caucus. And it's, this is an issue that both sides feel very, very strongly about. It's a matter of putting money where their mouths are right now and getting the politics out of this situation. But I think that um, we, to your point, we, we need more care and it's an investment. This is not spending money, it's investing money. That's the key thing because it costs a lot of money to take care of people who have mental illness. And if we can prevent it, isn't that smarter? I also you, think we need to educate providers. Like, um, you know, every time when you said the word lactation consultant, I, I went like this because I remember when I was giving birth, the idea of not breastfeeding your kid, the, the doulas, it, it was a really militant thing. And it was so shameful to not breastfeed yeah. your child. And so I think we need to- That stigma has relaxed. That's good, lot. yeah. Thank but God. I mean, I think we, in the medical profession, we need to make sure, I mean, not all doctors are like you. And so, you know, if we could have all the pediatricians ask, I mean, I did not have a doctor like you as a pediatrician. My pediatrician, when I tried to one time tell him how scared I was at the time, he was, he laughed and he's like, oh, all the mothers are like that, you'll get over it. And I mean, that I didn't tell anybody for months, you know, how I was feeling. So I think the language has, it for, from in my experience, oh, good. In my it's friends, it has changed a lot, a lot since the 90s, thank God. I mean, I wish you could have another kid. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm gonna um, have a grandchild. But I, yeah, it's just, it's, it, things have progressed for sure, of course, with your help, I mean, I'm sorry, the snoo. Wow. Yeah, she said so um, much. About I rented it. it as well. I rented it for four months. You don't, you know, the baby gets too big. You know, your baby's sleep trained. It's great. Um, it saved me in, in so many ways. But it, but it's, um, you know, there aren't as many people like you, and um, and and uh, and we just, I don't know. I just wish you could clone yourself. <laughs> you'll take over the. Yeah, it'll take over everything. It'll fix it all. Yeah. But still, you're in the you're, you know you're in the right place. You guys, we have time for one last question, and then I know everybody has to go and get on with their day. Our last question is going to come from Tessa Smith from Mama's Geeky. Hey guys, uh, one of the scenes that really stuck with me in this is at the bar, you know, when uh, Julie's sister-in-law is like yelling at her, and then as she's going to the bathroom, Julie hugs her, which I put had me in tears I love that scene can you just talk Amanda about that scene but Amy also about the importance of including that scene in my memory of that scene we didn't know it was just going to be I feel like I was like why or Jennifer and I Jennifer and I are best friends and um have gone through motherhood together and and I I mean I feel like I feel like we were think talking about we were all talking about it, and we're like what if we just 
made this okay for them? Like what if, because sometimes a hug or that kind of thing is so powerful that it can really um, just uh, balance everything. I mean, it's not, it, there's a, it was a huge struggle, a huge thing happening obviously family members of people suffering and, 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 and what, and what Julie put her through with her kids, it's something that's, it's hard to ever forgive someone for that. But at the same time, she's so, she's ill, she's a mental illness. She's, you know, she didn't mean it. And, and I think just seeing that, that was all it needed. I mean, it, we could have had another scene there. We were running out of time. I remember. Yeah, you you guys had actually written a scene that we were going to put in a bathroom, and we, and we couldn't even get to the bathroom. And we couldn't. We were and running then out of time. they had a whole thing. And it, what's amazing about that scene to me, because that scene's really just them, is that you have no idea what she says to her. You don't have an idea if she says she's sorry. You don't have any idea. It's, but you see on Jennifer's face, she reflexively hugs her and but you do see a sense of confusion and doubt. I mean, Jennifer does so much for us in that movie because she also says all the things that we're thinking, like, yeah. why would you ever do such a thing? Like, How about you everybody ever do else? Such a thing? Yeah. And, and I, think, I think she does a really um, amazing job for us in that movie and their friendship is so palpable. That's why you're into it. So thank you for mentioning that scene. Thanks. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you to Dr. Karp. Thank you to Amanda and Amy, and thank you guys for making this incredible movie. Um, as we said, I think it's time that we keep the conversation going from everybody's perspective. And um, thank you guys for taking the time to help us spread the word. Um, A Mouthful of Air opens in select theaters this Friday, um, October 29th. So thank, thank you, you guys for again. Being here and talking to us and uh, yeah. you know, like asking good questions. I could be here for the next three hours, um, <laughs> but I have to go to Seth uh, Myers like <laughs> yeah. in a few minutes. But, yeah, uh, but really, good. thank you. Thank you so much for, for hosting us. And Harvey, of course, like I thank you for everything yeah. you've done for me personally and for women and families and for being here and for posting us the other night. So yeah. and for thank you guys so much for this hard work. So lucky to have you on our yeah. team. I want to know more. I just want to know. I just yeah. want to, like, I just, <laughs> thank you guys. And thank you all. Thank you all. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.